Thanks again for joining us for our Facebook Live um, today. You can see I'm joined by two exceptional women, um, Jill Sauber, if you want to wave, and Sarah Sickenator. Um, I wanted to let you all know before we get started that we have been continuously updating our website with links on uh, resources for COVID-19 throughout the Twin Cities and nationally. We've been print, uh, posting some relevant articles on our blog. And then we're also working on a video library to put all of the Facebook Lives that we've been doing, uh, just to make sure that if you are not able to see them on my feed, that we, you can all go back there afterwards and you know go through them multiple times if you need to get the information that you need. Um, so if you want to go to our website, it's www.propertyhousepartners.com and the house is spelled H-A-U-S. And then Katie, if you could put that in the comment section, that would be great um, so that folks have access to that. So. Um, I want to just uh, do a quick introduction of Jill and Sarah um, before we get started, just so you kind of get an idea of how exceptional these women truly are in their field. Sarah um, is an attorney, an associate attorney at Mazur Amundsen and Boggio. Um, she practices elder law in their elder law department, and she specializes in estate planning, wills, guardianship, and conservatorships. Sarah truly does have a passion for helping people. I've noticed that she and I have um, done some work together and I've really seen that come out in her. That's why I asked her to come on today um, and be part of this and helping educate the folks out there so that we can at least get some certainty in a time of uncertainty. And then Jill Sauber um, has her own um, Sauber Law Services and she is focusing also on estate planning um, as they focus on their asset growth to long-term care planning. Um, and after death occurs, she also helps resolve the contested will or trust in litigation, counsels on medical assistance claims, and then guides families through the probate process. So two really exceptional women here today. Um, mostly the work that I've done with them has been through probate since Property House does help folks transitioning that real estate um, when families do inherit homes. And so again, like I said, I wanted to bring them on here because um, we had a discussion offline just about you know what's kind of happening right now with folks being stuck, um, you know whether they're in assisted living facilities, if they don't have wills, if they don't have healthcare directives, and we thought, hey, you know what, this is a really good topic that we can help folks on. And so, um, you know, to both of you, I know I just obviously said a lot of legal jargon there, you know, with um, you know powers of attorney, healthcare directives, all those things. So. Um, you know, I, I don't mind who says has, who says what, but it, it would just be really nice to kind of get like a quick and dirty of what some of those mean, just so that folks would know what we're talking about. So Sarah, maybe if you want to start. Sure. How about I cover healthcare directive and power of attorney and Jill, do you want to talk about wills? Sure. So there are different types of documents that somebody needs. There's documents for when you're alive and then documents for after you're dead. While you're alive, you really need a healthcare directive. And that is a document where you can nominate somebody to make medical decisions on your behalf if you become incapacitated or incompetent. In addition to that, you can also give them direction about when you would and wouldn't want care, uh, whether or not you'd wanna be buried or cremated, or you'd wanna donate your organs. It's an invaluable tool to make sure that your wishes with regard to healthcare are um, made by somebody you trust. The second document is a power of attorney, and that gives uh, the person you authorize the ability to make financial decisions on your behalf. So if you think of them as two, two pieces, you need both. One to make financial decisions, the other to make medical. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, and, and I, I think we generally lump those together as the disability planning documents. And I tell a lot of my clients that those are key while you're alive. And in fact, as an elder law attorney, I worry more about those documents than I do about a will. Um, you know, if something happens to you, it's gonna step in. Uh, a will, most people know what it is. Uh, it's a document where you designate someone to kind of collect all of your assets after you pass away, pay any last uh, debts or expenses, and then make distributions according to your wishes. Um, and that doesn't come into play until after you pass away. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and if anybody does have any questions about anything as we're going through this, please print them or type them in the comments and we'll be able to answer those questions, you know, throughout this and as we, um, you know, move forward on here. So, 
I mean, obviously with the changes now that are going on, I mean, we have stay at home that's in place now, shelter and ho shelter at home, you know, right now through April 30th. Has, has any of this really affected, you know, the way that you're able to care for your clients? Sarah, yeah. I'll ask you that first. Sure. Uh, it, it has, uh, even though we are considered, attorneys are considered essential uh, workers or employees, so our business continue can continue to operate, we can continue to go to work. Um, we have to be very cautious about the fact that we might be uh, infected or we might infect others. Uh, given the people that I work with, and I think Jill works with too, we work with vulnerable populations, the elderly, the disabled. So we have to be extra cautious. And right now, meeting in person is a very difficult thing. So much of our work, instead of being done in person, is being done uh, via telephone conferences and Zoom meetings. So that's really changed the practice um, for me. Great. Yeah, I can echo that. Bill? Yeah, same. I mean, um, I think we talked about this offline a lot about the, the issues with signing and executing documents, uh, not only because of the shelter in place, but also because of the, the risk, right? I mean, yeah, we could have meetings and go to facilities and meet with our clients. It's just, it's, it's kind of a case by case basis and, and what the attorney feels is appropriate based on the public health concerns. Um, and then we're having issues with notarization and signing. It's been kind of an obstacle that a lot of practitioners are trying to overcome right now. Um, and Jennifer, you're probably seeing that as well with real estate uh, documents. We have, yeah. Um, I mean, we, we still have, I've been going to different kinds of notaries and trying <laughs> to figure out who's open and, and get all of that done. So um, yes, it has been a struggle, but we're still able to you know continue and do closings since real estate has also been deemed an essential business as well. Yeah. And, and just to touch upon on that, on that Jill, but I know you wrote an article on LinkedIn um, the other day about you know elders in assisted living facilities. Um, and it really kind of struck me, uh, struck a chord actually saying that some are going without care um, and activities, you know, daily, like daily, um, daily living, like bathing, having no medication management, because the housing coordinators at the facilities, you know, aren't allowed in. I kind of talked about this a little bit on Tuesday with Nicole Will, um, and she's, you know, provides a lot of recreation um, on an online basis for these, these communities and saying like, you know, they can't have folks go in there to help. So um, and I know you asked too about, you know, the executive order that was put in place, obviously with the shelter in place. Is there any kind of update on, on what's happening that with that and folks and, you know, assisted living facilities or otherwise? Uh, I wish I, I wish I had an update. Um, it's kind of ongoing. It's one of the struggles that we're seeing with our clients right now. Um, I have a situation that I kind of outlined in my LinkedIn article that uh, we're just trying to provide for our clients as best we can, knowing that the facilities have an uphill battle and they don't want to run the risk of bringing in people that are infected either. Um, so we're just trying to figure out how best to accommodate for all the pandemic related, um, you know, uh, shelter in place that's happening, isolation. Uh, I don't have an update, unfortunately. We're working on it. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be something too, that if there is that something comes out, I suppose you would probably list it on your website. We'll have it on our website. Um, and, you know, just to kind of keep people updated to let them know that there is, you know, help on the way, hopefully. Yeah, and I would encourage people just put in a little plug for the Ombudsman for Long-Term Care. Um, they're an advocate for families and residents of facilities. So if there are any issues that are happening, before you reach out to an attorney and pay one of us, <laughs> Uh, you know, to write a demanding letter, you can reach out to the ombudsman. They're on top of it. Um, other practitioners in this area are working closely with the ombudsman and other organizations to try to help our clients and residents. So you can reach out to them. Now, with that being said, I know this is kind of, a, do you know anything like outside the state, if we have folks that are watching that aren't in Minnesota, is this type of same, do you know if the same type of thing is going on everywhere else too? at least where these shelter in place is, is you know, happening? Yes, um, and I, I don't know, Sarah can probably speak to this too. Um, I'm part of uh, the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, or NALA, and we're on the listservs, we're all talking about these same issues. Yes, it's happening all across the board. Okay. 
And you know, different states have different signing requirements for documents and different regulations with regard to nursing home and skilled care. So it really is dependent upon the state, but certainly this is a, a nationwide issue that no matter what the rules in your state are, every, every attorney um, is struggling with how to best, every elder law attorney anyway, is struggling with how to best serve their clients um, when we can't see them, when we can't visit, um, and maybe when they can't reach out to us. Right, right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, obviously more to come on that stance, of course, as this kind of moves forward and everybody's just sort of learning as we go, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, so Sarah, I mean, I, we kind of talked about this a little too, and I just wanted to, you know, kind of dive in a little deeper that, you know, which, what should someone do, um, you know, if a loved one is sick with, you know, COVID-19 or any other kind of, you know, ailment right now, if they're in one of these facilities or at home or, um, and, you know, they don't have any kind of will or estate plan or healthcare directive or any of that stuff in place, like what, what can they do? So I guess I would tell people if they don't have a plan in place or if their plan is outdated, now is not the time to panic. Um, I think there's a lot of needless anxiety about the fact that people haven't gotten to estate planning or gotten to update their plans. But I think it's important to understand that if you don't have a will or a healthcare directive or a power of attorney and there's no way for you to get one done, the law has a uh, fallback for you. So in the event that somebody dies and they don't have a will, Minnesota law steps in and says who their heirs are. So the people who would inherit their estate. And if you're married and this is your first marriage and you have joint children, you know, everything goes to your spouse. Um, if you're not married, but you have children, everything goes to your children. So if you don't have a circumstance where it's a second or third marriage or you have non-joint children, um, I would say don't panic. Um, or if you're unmarried with no children, it goes to your parents or your siblings, and maybe that's what you would want anyway. So a lot of people have this misconception that if they die without a will, the state takes everything. And that's just not the case. It, there's a statutory scheme in place to make sure that nobody's estate um, lacks beneficiaries. Great. Thank you. That really helps. I think explain quite a bit of that because I know Obviously, we're, you know, some folks are not able to get in to see their loved ones. Um, and, you know, that could be really hard if they, you know, pass and there's nothing set in place or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So that, that really does help clarify that some. Um, Jill, I, I, kind of on that same note, I know that you're also, you know, a licensed mortician. Um, can you just kind of update us a little bit on, you know, what's been happening with, you know, wakes or funerals or different things like that if, if folks are passing away during this time? Yeah, so I've heard from my colleagues who are still practicing as funeral directors and morticians. Um, because you can't gather more than 10 people, or if you do, you still have to be six feet away, a lot of funerals are being postponed. Um, with the advent of the memorial service and more people cremating with memorial services, it's easier to postpone um, to have that gathering or that celebration later. Um, you know, I've heard that some people are doing kind of graveside services, but people are kind of separated. And so it's, it's not the same. I mean, it's, it's a struggle that we're seeing all over the world. It's not just in the U S. Um, but we are having to postpone a lot of funeral services. Uh, funeral directors are still busy and they're still doing their job. It's just, we're not having those gatherings. Yeah. I do know a friend of mine's grandmother passed away not too long ago and they did have a funeral and it was really sad. They have a big family and every, you know, family was in like six foot distance clumps, you know, from each other. And it just, yeah, like you said, it wasn't really the same. So, um, you know, and obviously people aren't going to stop passing away just because there's, you know, a virus. So um, what, what are you, I mean, are people still able to visit, you know, loved ones then if they are passing, like, is there any kind of exception for end of life care that you've seen? There is. Yeah. Um, there's a CMS guidance memo. CMS is the centers for, um, Medicaid and Medicare services. And they, uh, came out with a nursing home guidance memo for nursing homes to be able to allow in certain people. So with these restrictions in place, they're still saying if there's hospice care or end of life 
care or it's a situation where it's um, very end of life, they are allowing in family and friends under certain circumstances. You still have to go through the, the protocol to get in, right? You might need to get your temperature taken. Maybe they have you in a separate room. Uh, they see what sort of symptoms you have. And if you have any symptoms of COVID, they won't let you in. Um, but there is a carve out or exception for end of life situations, yes. Okay, that's helpful. Maybe it can ease some fears about that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in that side of things, Sarah, I mean, you know, obviously as people are, are still passing away, their, you know, legal representation and attorneys have been deemed essential. Um, how's the court system handling all of this stuff since nobody can be there either? What's, what's happening on that side of things? So the Minnesota district courts or the state courts are subject to uh, an order and an amended order from the Minnesota Supreme Court, which limits the types of cases that can be heard right now. So there are a list of emergency cases only that uh, the court will set a hearing for. So if it's a, uh, a probate that has no emergency situation um, or any other type of hearing, child support, uh, uh, any other family divorce type of case, those are just being put on hold um, until further notice. And that's creating some confusion because the application of the Minnesota Supreme Court order is varying from county to county. So what they're doing in one county might not be what they're doing in another. Um, in Hennepin County, they're having telephonic hear hearings for emergency cases. Um, and that went pretty well when I was on one last week, but I've heard in other counties, they're not doing that. So everybody just has to be patient right now. Um, it's a difficult situation for the courts to try to navigate around. And I'm concerned that once the courts get back up and running and we're doing in-person hearings, there, it's going to be um, a lot. There's gonna be a lot of cases on at the same time. There's gonna be a lot of waiting. So I wish I could give clients assurances that their case would be heard in May or June or July, but we just don't know. Right, right. I mean, what, what advice, you know, whether it's through healthcare directives, a probate, I mean, you know, in closing this discussion, what do you feel like, you know, would be the most, um, you know, the best thing that somebody could do right now if they don't have any of these things set in place? Jill. <laughs> um, well, I have a, I have sort of a planning list on my website. That's a good starting place to kind of collect information. Um, so get it together, right? Get your information together. Talk with your spouse. If you are looking at updating or creating your documents, uh, you know, talk through who you'd want to make those decisions and then reach out to the attorney to get started on it. Like Sarah said, it's not an emergency necessarily. You don't need to panic. But now is a great time for us to all visit those documents and, and the information. And to echo that, now is a perfect time. Uh, we have more free time on our hands uh, because we're not gathering. Um, so now is the time to look into creating an estate plan or updating your estate plan. And if, if someone's feeling anxious about uh, what to do next, call an attorney, have a 15 minute conversation and get some assurances about what would happen to you if you became ill or you passed away without documents in place or if a loved one's passed away, what, what do you have to do next? So I think just contacting an attorney and getting some instruction or guidance would help a lot. Right, thank you, that was really helpful. So what, what I've done is, Katie, if you wanna post that link um, in the comments there. Um, you know, we, I created just a, a link for folks that if they wanted to get more information, um, they, there's a landing page that I created that if you want more information, you can just click on that link there and you'll be sent more information. And then also, obviously this is a really, really big topic, right? And there's a lot of facets to what we were talking about. And so coming back and revisiting some of these things I think would be appropriate since there is so much to talk about and things are constantly changing daily, weekly, if not hourly at this point. And so if you guys do have, you know, questions or want more things discussed um, a little bit further 
answer it in the email that you receive. And like I said, we can set something up again, you know, down the road where we're able to answer these questions. I can have Sarah and Jill back on um, if they'd like to, which I would love to have. Um, and yeah, with that, I mean, do you have any closing, you know, advice or anything that you'd like to say to folks before we sign off? I guess just stay home, be safe, wash your hands, all this, all the standard stuff right now. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, ditto from me. Just take care of yourself and take care of the people you love. Perfect. Thank you. I want to thank you ladies for joining me. Um, and like I said, if anything comes through in terms of questions and things like that, we'll put together, you know, another one of these live events and, and get those questions out to folks uh, as quickly, or excuse me, those answers out to folks as quickly as possible. And hopefully, like I said, get through this all together. Awesome. Thanks, Jen, so much for having me on. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for joining me. All right. We'll see you Thanks. soon. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>